um, in a very complex environment to achieve digital transformation success. We also want to talk you through the digital disruptors that we see that are relevant to all your roles in supply chain and logistics today. But before we get into the meat of those two aspects of the, of the lecture, I mentioned at the outset that we'd like a little bit of audience participation. And we want to understand your experience and, and perspectives around you know, digital and what that means for you. So what we're going to do is go into this uh, Menti app. And trust me, it is all very simple. If you, if you follow the instructions, it will all be fine, I promise. Um, so if you can go to www.menti.com on your phone or web browser and type in the code that you can see on the screen there, 989. 0833, you'll begin to see a number of questions appear that we want to gauge the response of the audience around. You can also scan the QR reader, uh, the QR code there on the right with your phone, and that will immediately send you, send you to the app. Um, we'll give people a few minutes to do that. Oh, that's all happening straight away. So the instant instant impact. So the first question is, what does, what does digital mean to you? Um, really looking to understand the scale of people's perspectives on digital and what that actually means. So from the left of ARC, we've got it's real and it's delivering benefits now um, through to I'm, I'm less certain about it. There's lots going on, but it needs more time to embed all the way through to there's lots of people talking about it, but I'm not really seeing the benefit. We'll just give this a little bit of time to sort of tick in, but I think we're seeing a, a, clear, a clear leader from the audience around this about it being real and it's delivering now, which I'm, I'm really pleased to see actually in terms of people's, people's, job, people's roles, what people are perceiving. Um, I guess a lot of that probably driven by the lockdown, the ability to to utilize digital. What we see a lot in the sector is, is actually more towards the middle space around there's, there's lots of discussion you know, going on and it's providing some benefit, but in terms of translating the technology into real business benefit is the art of the challenge. And we'll talk about that uh, a little bit later on as we go through the presentation. Can we go to the next, the second question now? That's, that's really good to see. Um, so the next question is, is defense different? And again, a, a sort of sliding scale of perspectives here from, you know, we're unique, um, but we're special, but there's opportunity to learn from other areas. And there's lots we can learn from relevant sectors through actually, we're not different at all. And again, I think, I think we'd align and agree with the perspective there is actually there's lots that can be learned from adjacent sectors and transposed into defense. And I think there's a real art in understanding the, the peculiarities, the, the small amount of uniqueness that there is in defense to be able to transfer and pull through those ideas. And also um, addressing you know, some of the historical hurdles and the culture that allows for that, that translation. And we certainly spend a lot of our time, both in industry and in defense, looking at what people do in, in today's example, in a mining environment, but also in commercial aerospace, in automotive, and as Angus said as well, in, in the oil and gas sector. Um, so thank you for that. So the last question, um, perhaps, you know, the more obvious one about whose responsibility is, is digital, but there are some underlying um, tricks around this. Um, so yes, we're going for the 100% on, on everybody's responsibility. Um, a user's responsibility, leadership, yes, definitely. I think the key I, I bring out to this that we'll talk later on about is, yes, it's everybody's responsibility, but it can't be everybody's responsibility in a stovepipe. It needs to be collective responsibility across, across a value chain. And, and we'll talk a lot more about that later on. Um, Interestingly, I think there are strong elements of leadership that need to drive digital through combined with the, the, the user-centric nature. And again, we'll, we'll get onto all these topics later. Um, good to see, I'm pleased personally to see that, that 
nobody sees the IT department uh, as being responsible for digital. Okay, um, so thanks very much for that. So what, what we, uh, yeah, if we can just go back to the presentation, thank you. What we often feel and see in, in industry, in, uh, from a consulting perspective as we're working in industry is digital feeling a little bit like, you know, the emperor's new clothes, um, where, you know, there's lots going on, um, not necessarily seeing all the value that's being delivered to that. I can see from the audience um, from the first question that actually it's great to see a lot of that being full, pulled through and the value being delivered. Um, and we completely agree, you know, I, I think it's real, I think it's here now, but I think there's a, there's a number of um, challenges to be able to access the value and the benefit, and we need to get the right environment and factors for success. We need to fix the basics, and that's really around process simplification and data quality, and in a way that's sustainable and, and core within the operations uh, and the model in, in which um, applications and activities are delivered. It must be user-centric and based around the value chain. And this aligns the user and the corporate benefit, which supports change and adoption. If we go back to the last question about everybody's responsibility versus the users versus leadership, having the user centricity around a value chain allows that change and adoption to happen. And I'll talk more about that in the case study. It needs to be practical. And obvious, but this is often overlooked. We obviously put in too much complexity and a lot of the work that needs to be done in the short term is around process simplification and not over engineering um, and not making it right first time, realizing that some things will fail and we need to be iterative around it. And lastly, picking up to the last question, it does need to be collaborative, but beyond the stakeholders that you saw there, it needs to be cross-function, cross-site, cross-enterprise. And we're seeing a huge demand for multi-tier supply chain transparency and collaboration. But with that, it brings a new way of working. And again, we'll get into some of these topics as we get into the discussion. Before I get into the case study and talk you through the mining operation and bring this to life with a real example, I'm gonna hand over to Simon, who's gonna give uh, a description of the, the key disruptors that he's seeing in the supply chain and logistics space. Over to you, Simon. No, th th thank you, Ross, and uh, um, th thank you, Angus, also for the earlier introduction. Um, so as, as Ross just says, um, yeah, before we jumped into this evening's main event, if you like, which will be the Connected Mine uh, case study, I did want to take some time to step back a little and look at the wider context of disruption in supply chain and logistics. So this slide illustrates the unprecedented level of change with the convergence of digital and business disruptions impacting across the entire supply value chain. Firstly, on digital disruptions, a significant number of new and emergent technologies with those highlighted purple, perhaps most relevant to logistics in defense and other asset intensive industries. To call out just a few, much of which will soon be brought to life in the Connected Mind case study. Uh, firstly, cloud-based solutions. We see rapid growth in this area within, within the function of supply chain, uh, both from established players evolving from the ERP space, uh, but also a very active startup ecosystem offering highly specialized, but yet very accessible supply chain solutions. IoT or Internet of Things, effectively democratizing sensor data, creating huge volumes of data from the asset as it passes through the life cycle from cradle to grave. Digital Twin, the capability to model, visualize and manage the asset based on the emerging IoT data. Analytics or big data analytics capabilities that allow us to create insights from data with many different use cases from descriptive what's happening to predictive what's likely to happen or even to prescriptive what could happen if you did something differently. And then to business disruptions, a mix of macroeconomic and customer expectation changes. And just to call out a few, uh, sustainability, of course, has moved well up the agenda to become one of few levers against which to optimize supply chain 
starting even to draw alongside cost and service level in some cases. Geopolitical uncertainty, of course, border friction in light of Brexit, a pertinent example of this. Everything at speed. Employees are consumers too. They don't leave heightened expectations at home when they come to work. Additionally, we see how the COVID pandemic has heightened people's awareness of digital, namely to reduce the human touch points in a process, facilitating remote working and reducing costs, but also to sharpen considerations of supply chain resilience. Suddenly it's everyone's problem and recognized in mainstream media. Of course, with this disruption comes great opportunity, and we'll begin to explore in today's lecture some of that opportunity and how it relates to the Connected Mine case study. Before doing that, we wanted briefly to look at a recent global supply chain study. Accenture undertakes a supply chain research study every few years, and the most recent of which was completed in just the last six months. The study gauges what's on the mind of our supply chain clients in all key industry groups and all major geographies. The latest study found some recurring challenges common to the majority of respondents as supply chain executives grapple with the disruption described on the previous slide. Namely, flexibility, production or supply chain constraining the ability to differentiate customer propositions or operational effect ecosystem design. In a world where ecosystem design and partnerships are increasingly important, how do you choose future winners to partner with? The research shows this to be a real challenge. Digital architecture, technology continuing to be developed in silos, stifling collaboration. Innovation, how to get past new shiny toys to scalable operational value propositions. And finally, visibility, you know, perhaps an age old problem, but the research shows that this is still a very real problem for the majority of supply chain executives. The good news from the study is that what makes a supply chain master is actually quite simple. And a supply chain master being one whose company performance sits in the top 25th percentile of their peer group. Briefly, those ingredients. Masters design customer-centric or customer-led supply chains. That is to say that they start with the operational output requirements and then work backwards up the supply chain in architecting and developing supporting capability. They are able to scale innovation into commercial value propositions with operational effect supported by digital. Masters are good at select capabilities, but only select capabilities. They partner for the rest. Again, this heightens the importance of ecosystem design. And finally, they develop senior sponsorship for supply chain improvement initiatives to drive behavioral change and adoption through the organization to realize benefits from investments. But ultimately, despite all of the change and disruption happening across supply chain, the brilliant basics of supply chain hold true. Right product, right place, right time, right cost. It's just that the evolution of data in the supply chain and the ability to use digital to create value from this data has allowed organizations to become more successful across these four fundamentals. So it's with that in mind, I'll hand back now to Ross and we'll begin to explore how digital was used to create value from data in a global mining enterprise. Ross, back to you. Thanks, Simon. Um, okay, so, so let's um, now dive in to the case study. Uh, and what I'm gonna take you through is the outcome of a journey to digital transformation for you know, this mining operation. And I'll talk you through the, the story and the real the ingredients for success. So if we step back and think about the primary purpose of a mine, the purpose of a mine is to very simply you know, get material out the ground, crush it, sort it, treat it, ship it. And that is the core purpose that we'll always roll back to and we'll always think about. What was life like before the digital transformation? Well, this is a heavy industrial environment with a primary focus around safety. It was very siloed and paper-based 
um, with a lot of the supervisors using radio comms to stay in touch and understanding the landscape around them. And this put a lot of burden on the supervisors who were managing the assets, managing productivity, but didn't really have the right information and weren't cited on the end-to-end -end transparency of operations to be able to make the best decisions. They therefore relied heavily on judgment and using their experience to make up for the lack or latency in data that was available to them. This lack of end-to-end -end visibility didn't get the right controls across all levels of the organization and allow everybody to understand what the priorities were on site and make effective decisions. The information was also backward looking with a significant issue on information latency um, to make those proactive decisions. The two critical ingredients that I'll talk about going forward, the first is user centricity in the digital transformation and putting users at the heart of the change that you want to make. It's critical in understanding their world, what issues they're facing and what causes the, the lost or non-value adding time that affects the, the production and the delivery of the mine and how they're networked together um, as users to give collective um, production and output from their work. You also want to use this activity to capture the ideas that they've got on how they want to approve and align them to the business objectives. So at the very start of this project, um, two um, design user journey designers were deployed to work at the coalface, um, pardon the pun, and begin to understand the user journey um, at, the, at the heart of the mining operation. And what I would say about this is, is this is a specialist skill it's not process mapping exercise. It's truly understanding the user journey, the user centricity, and beginning to think through the solutions and technical apps applications that could be, could be deployed. The other key aspect of the project and any digital transformation is getting to value quickly. The speed to value is of the utmost importance to be able to show progress and show benefit back to the users but also to the sponsors who were investing in the project. In this case, a minimum viable product, as we call it, the minimum product that you can get that begins to add value and address you know, at least some of the user challenges, you know, was achieved in 12 weeks. And that's not uncommon for the type of, of digital transformation delivery to get an MVP developed. And then a continued program of development to evolve that MVP into the, the product that I'll, I'll take you through now. So let's get an overview um, of the mine itself and we'll dive through um, the different aspects of it. Just bear with us um, while we get the run through. That's showing for me, Jess. Ross, can you see that? Um, I can't see, ah, uh, I can, it might just be coming through now. It might be a lag on my, um, yes, I can see, I can see it now. So we've got the flyby, Jess. Okay, right, we got there. Um, so what you're seeing here is part of the digital twin of the mine. Um, and as you can see, it's the digital representation, you know, of the physical landscape itself. The, the imagery that you can see is captured from a number of sensors, which were either newly installed or actually were already existing in the mine. And part of the activity um, was to understand how you could connect them together to um, provide visualizations like this and the other dashboards I'll take you through to deliver value. The actual camera shot that you're seeing here comes from a drone 
that flies to capture the topography of the mine and to understand the landscape. The color coding that you see of the surface is based on the mine's material type. And this allows the, the, the management and leadership team to identify where they should be mining um, and make the best decisions. The yellow dots that you'll see around um, are a combination of drills that extract a material from the ground, shovels that load them onto trucks, and then trucks which actually take the materials away for processing. These assets all have GPS on them and also asset monitoring activity for predictive maintenance, which I'll, I'll talk about later. One of the core components of this um, solution was built up around health and safety. So each of the individuals have a personal lanyard on them, which gives a, a certain biometric information. And I'll talk more about that later. So the purpose of having these IoT sensors in place and understanding their technology is really built around the business need and the value chain that I'll talk about next. The purpose of this is to make sure that the assets are in the right location and that you can smooth bottlenecks and that the mining areas can be quickly activated. You will also see, oh yeah, what? Well, you'll also see on the demonstration the road paths um, that were the road paths of the mine. And actually those are color coded depending on the health of the road itself. So some of the roads were, um, were obviously green so that they could be processed and that the, the trucks could travel through them. But the trucks were fitted with sensors. Um, and you can see that truck there, TR19, traveling over a red road. That, that means that actually the road has got you know, some issues with it or, or it could be a risk of, of failure. And obviously that causes delay in processing and moving trucks around. And as you'll see later, the movement of trucks around a site is one of the critical um, bottlenecks you know, within um, the processing operation. So to actually get that data, and that issue was picked up from the user journeys as a real problem pain point, to get that data, um, new sensors were fitted onto the vehicles so that they could actually monitor um, the roads as they were passing over them so that the supervisors uh, and the management team could understand you know, the optimal way to move trucks around the site. So I mentioned before, um, there was two critical aspects to the central components, I call them, to the digital transformation. The second part is the value chain. So the simple value chain of a mine is extract the material, um, crush the material, treat the material, and get the material out you know, to a port so that it can be shipped. The reason that this is so important um, is to get a digital representation of the performance of the operation. And this is key in terms of a central, a central tool that brings together the user centricity with the business need and value. The users can see the performance of the mine in this and dive into the, the detail that they need to understand to do their jobs. Whilst the management team can understand the production and the performance of the material, um, of, the, of the performance of the mine. So centering, centering the whole digital transformation around the value chain and the user centricity was key to this whole transformation activity. You'll notice that the value chain is simple and it captures live performance data against a target. We worked again with the management team, the leadership team and the users to agree what the target uh, metrics were and agree what the tolerances were to identify you know, what would be green and what would be red. And now very visually that the management team, the hierarchy, as well as the supervisors who are key to this, and I'll come on to those shortly, can make decisions on where the bottlenecks are, where the challenges are, what's going to slow down production through this, through this value chain. This allows you to see the end-to-end -end performance so you can make better decisions within the context of the whole. It excludes transactional and functional activities because these are enablers to support the value chain and the focus needs to be about 
production through that value chain. And the RAG criteria is very optically easy to see. This brings together the stakeholders in a common purpose and helps drive the change and adoption. It also highlights one of the key messages about digital. The purpose of digital isn't about giving you the answer. It's not there to tell you the answer. The system shouldn't tell you what to do. Many people are motivated by autonomy, mastery, and purpose, and digital helps enable this. It gives people the right information to support the job that they're doing, and it allows them to make better and faster decision-making by giving them the right information live at their fingertips. The other aspect of this is it's forward-looking. You know, many of the reports that we'll use today will be out of date by the time we've read, read them. A lot of the quarterly or, or monthly business reviews that are done are retrospective based on data that was actually achieved last night, and uh, sorry, last month. And therefore you're explaining why something went wrong rather than looking forward and taking corrective action before, before it can happen. So this digital um, solution allows people to be more forward focused and how we change future metrics and performance. We talk about the value chain being central to this, and that's because the stakeholders around it can, can all orientate around the value chain. So a key component of this is, is the executive dashboard. So if we can now zoom out, we can actually look at this um, crater of diamonds mine that we were, we were running the demonstration from, but it allows the corporate or group to look at the portfolio of performance across their minds. And it allows them to take the corrective action that they, they need to take about managing investors, understanding you know, where they are in their performance and, and, and what that means to the value of the business. But, one of, but with this level of transparency and data also begins to change the culture and the way in which we work. Let me give an example. If the mine wasn't performing where it needed to, there could be an automatic intervention from group to get on the phone and ask them to you know, improve what they're doing. Whereas that didn't occur in the old world where the, the report would go through you know, tiers and tiers of review and be out of date by the time, by the time it got to the, to the seniors or the leadership team. Now you've got an opportunity where data and live performance will be transparent and how we play that into transparent supply chains, multi-tier supply chains, and how we act around those is going to be key. So I see going forward a huge behavioral activity around how we, how we have trust in performance data if we truly want to be transparent across hierarchies and across elements of the supply chain and the supply chain tiers. Now we've zoomed out from the value chain, what we're gonna do is we're gonna zoom in back through the value chain and come back to this, this concept of, of user centricity. So the value chain that you saw is primarily driven by supervisors who manage the assets on site. So uh, a lot of this was designed with the supervisors in mind as well as the asset operators in mind. So what you see here is is George's dashboard. Now, George, you can see up there, George Long, he's the supervisor, who, who he's a supervisor who manages um, a number of assets within the mine. And he can use this dashboard you know, after looking at the value chain and understanding if there's any bottlenecks in the crusher or any other points to see where, how he best deploys those based on, based on his priorities. So he can see the, the drilling activity, he can see the availability of the assets, how they're being utilized, um, and their availability. Um, if you could just go back to the asset, thank you. Um, and also he can see the overall performance of each one of those, those drills. So he can, he, he can see his amber across the board here. So he's going to have to make you know, some interventions in the drilling, shoveling to get, get himself back on track. But as you see, it, it's very... The, 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 because of the user journey, this is very much what George has wanted to see from the user journey work and very simple to understand so that he can make the, the right interventions. If we, if we dive now into, um, into one of the trucks 
areas. Um, so you saw on the previous example, you know, the trucks moving uh, around site. This is um, George's dashboard for the trucks. So he can see all the trucks there, what their performance is, the availability, um, all the way through to the cycle time. So this all links back into the value chain because everything is about delivering progress performance through the value chain. You can also see here, um, there is a, there's a reason for delay that's captured. And I'll come on to that at the end because it's really important to be able to learn the lessons for delay so you can predict things better for the future and make interventions going forward. But if we could um, dive into tr one of the trucks there, we can give an overview of what that actually looked like. So I'm, I'm, I'm George now. You know, I've, I've, I want to check in on truck number 14 to see how it's performing. And this is the dashboard that, that George can see. And it, it really has, you know, two main components. One is how is this truck performing against task? And he can see the productivity, the payloads, and how much tons he's hauled against a benchmark that he needs to be achieved going forward. And he can take the corrective action against that. The second part, and again, really important part, which um, led to a lot of the, 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 the bottom line, the cost savings in this, was picking up the predictive maintenance aspect of this. So what George is able to do here is getting the um, information off the assets around its usage, around its maintenance patterns. You know, he's given um, alerts and options around how, how that asset is maintained and any actions that he needs to take. And what he can then do is create a work order off the back of this to be able to address those, those maintenance issues pretty immediately so they can get, they can get actioned. And that's the, the, um, the piece at the bottom. The other core component that I'd like to pick out is tires. And again, maybe not something that you would expect to see in the dashboard, but something that was picked up, one from the user journeys, but also from the management team around tires failing or, or tires um, maintaining tires was a huge problem. Each tire on one of those vehicles is around 60,000 pounds each. So they're not cheap. And what this tended to cause supervisors to do, to do two things. One, it, they couldn't afford it to fail. So they took a risk averse view to maintenance, which meant they took the asset out of commission and the tires were replaced. They were replaced early when they could have had more life in them, which, which is a, 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 loss of, a, a, a loss of cost reduction or an efficiency that could be gained. The other alternative is, is you, you, you're, you're too risky with it. And then the risk there is actually the tires can fail. Um, and from a safety and a recovery impact on a complex industrial site, there's a number of challenges around why that causes problems as well from a safety perspective. But it also costs um, productivity in terms of you know, a bottleneck of having that asset out and having to transfer you know, its load into another area. So tires were, were a big, big area that came up on the, on the user journey activity um, and, and monitoring their performance was, was one of the key indicators that they wanted to see. Now, with this one, actually, as part of the project, the team got in touch with Caterpillar who make the tires, who were told actually that there's already sensors within the tires. They just needed to connect them, pull the data in and be able to put the control uh, metrics around it to be able to understand, you know, the, the health of the tire so that they could make, you know, the right decisions. <laughs> As you can see with this, this truck here is probably not the healthiest one with um, sort of five reds and an amber. I suspect George, you know, will be, will be looking to take immediate action um, around that one so that he can make the right decisions around, you know, diverting that truck, getting on the phone, to the operator of it um, and making the right, the right calls. But again, again, there's some key messages that I wanted to get across you know, within this. One was about the user centricity. The other one was about the value chain. One of the points was about actually, this isn't do it, digital isn't doing your job and giving you the answer. Digital should be about how do I empower people to make better decisions? How do I give them sight on information that they don't currently have? 
How do I stop people, you know, manipulating data and playing around with spreadsheets so that they can spend their time, you know, doing the valuable activities you know, that they should be doing and the value within it? This activity in itself, I think, has huge relevance to the defense sector where we are looking to get, you know, maintenance um, and usage data out of platforms. We are looking for consistent ways of being able to convert that into, you know, better actions that can be taken to extend life, to be able to improve utilization of assets and increase their availability. This activity um, alone, you know, was increasing the, the equipment life by, by 22%. So, uh, you know, quite an astonishing figure and also increasing the component life by, by 10%. And fuel, again, was another core aspect, you know, of, of cost within the, within the mine. And they managed to decrease the fuel usage by, by 13% using this activity. But again, it's, it's starting with the user journey. It's understanding the needs. It's understanding the problems and what people want to see. And working with people like George, you know, to mock up the dashboard on, on what they want to see so that they can do their job better and be more empowered to make, you know, better decisions with better data. If we can go to look at the shovel now, again, so um, the truck is is obviously, so the process is you, you drill it, you shovel it, you truck it. Um, the shovels are the ones that move, you know, the materials that have been extracted into the trucks. Um, it looks again, George has got a, a tough time on shovel number six with quite a few reds there around, you know, its availability and utilization. Um, and again, looking at the shovels, you can see, you know, the, the, the average payload is shifting, um, how much it's loaded, and then the sort of tons, tons per hour that it's looking to move as a rate. So again, all looking at outcome-based metrics so that you can get a rapid understanding of performance and importantly, link it back to the value chain against which, you know, all of the, all of the operators on the site, you know, you know recognize. Um, you've also got the uh, predictive maintenance alarms you know, in the same way. Um, but what I wanted to draw your attention to on this one was the, the truth, the tooth metrics um, system of health. Now, coming back to the user journeys again, one of the, the catastrophic events that was mentioned from a business risk perspective is losing one of these teeth into the crusher. So there's only there's only one main facility for crushing. And if that's down, then actually there's a huge impact in the rest of the value chain. And actually the capacity through that crusher is, is one of the bottlenecks that they experience. But if they were to lose a tooth into that crusher, you know, these are made from, you know, hardened metal, but they can break off. The crusher can be down, you know, for several days. So this was a key um, problem, catastrophic failure that they wanted to address. And again, previous methods would have been, you know, the supervisor using various bits of paper and his memory and speaking to supervisors to try and form a best view around how do we take that asset out and manage to the health of the teeth and then decide to put it, put it back in or not. And again, a lots of decisions based on, you know, real gaps of information, but using, you know, best judgment and experience. Through this process, we worked um, with this mining company to create a high definition video which used visual analytics live in the cab to monitor the health of those teeth in, in any point in time, as well as track the amount of usage that went, went with it. So that actually, you know, it could provide the supervisor here, George, with a health monitoring system around the, around the teeth which again, the primary purpose of that was to give him better information so he can prove, improve utilization of the asset, productivity of the asset, as well as the reducing the impact of sort of catastrophic failure of losing you know, one of the teeth into um, the system. So they were, they were the two elements I wanted to pick up in terms of, in terms of the assets and really focus on how do you get information of usage off the assets to make better predictive maintenance decisions. 
but also think creatively around where the areas of lost utilization, lost production are, where the areas of risk are. And again, speaking to the users to really understand, you know, what their challenges are that they're facing. Excuse me, I'll just get a drink of water. <clears throat> I gave a, a teaser during the mine um, flow through around um, personal lanyards, which, which individuals were wearing. So what we've just done here is each asset has an operator and we've just clicked on that individual operator and you can see towards the top left, you know, this operator's name is, is Clarence Lewis, um, who, who obviously then reports into to George as, as the supervisor. This is um, a personal dashboard for, for Clarence so that George and, and the business can understand, you know, how his personal performance, but more importantly, from a health and safety perspective. So, each of the individuals, each of the operators on site were given RFID lanyards with, with panic buttons, which they wore on them at all time. And this had a number of advantages. So from a, a value chain and an operations perspective, it could tell you what their operational performance was and what work orders that they were working on. But the primary interest that the company wanted to to install this capability was around safety. And one of the core aspects of the business case was around safety. I've talked a lot so far about performance, business, value chain metrics, but actually I said at the very beginning, one of the core um, focus of the attention um, was a safety first culture for the mine. And what having digital sensors on the assets and on the individuals gave them a completely different perspective on how they could look after their people and reduce the amount of, of safety issues that were occurring. Um, so the, the RFID lanyard itself also has a panic button that can be pressed at any one time. And as you can see here, it picks up the key vital signs for the individuals, but also picks up the data from the system to say, when did they have a la last have a break? Um, when, how many consecutive working days have they been done? And how many hours have they, they've been on shift? So the, um, the controller, George, can clearly see um, how they're operating, whether they're operating within policy and take the right direction. It also picks up the, the, the vital signs, as you can see there, around their heart rate, their blood pressure, the temperature, the respiration and obviously in a mining environment, the, the respiration and the particulates that take place in the environment that we'll see here, the dust particulates and the noise are a, are a key attribute in understanding the health and safety environment that that operator was working in. They never had this level of information at their fingertips that they could make you know, the right decisions or safety first decisions for their employees. And what this process has done now is built up um, a, a, from historic data um, and been able to build a fatigue score. So again, looking at prediction, looking forward around preventative measures, the fatigue score that you see here is based on a combination of factors and will give um, a combination of environment factors, health factors, time factors, that will give George a better understanding of the predictive fatigue of this operator, Clarence Lewis, and whether he, that there's a danger and that he needs to be able to act on that or whether, whether it's okay. As you'd expect, you know, there's lots going on um, in, in a number of people that George is looking at. He can't look at all the screens all the time. So there are alerts built into this system that will tell George when there's a problem. So if, if, for example, you know, the blood pressure, you know, dropped below a certain level or the heart rate went up a certain level or the predictive fatigue, you know, went above the, the red line, you know, George would be pinged, you know, with an alert immediately that allowed him to act. And again, 
that alert doesn't tell George what to do. It warns him that there's something there that you need to act on so that he can do his job and he can, he can focus on, on what needs to be done. So the health and safety aspect, I think, has, has huge applications. It doesn't include a, a permit to work activity, but that's something I, I, I definitely know, you know, is being talked about in defence around, you know, losing a lot of the documentation and having a source of truth around, you know, permits to work and qualifications of, of operators. The last part of the demonstration um, I wanted to talk to you about was the... Um, the value decision. So um, I, I, I talked before about the performance through um, the value chain and on George's dashboard, there was a, a column at the end that says, you know, what is the key driver for, you know, underperformance or lost time? That information all gets collected um, together um, to this, this tab that looks at value, value decisions. And what this, what this picks up is the key, um, uh, the top five, it says it there, impacts for um, utilization of the assets. So the one to pick up for me, oh, the obvious one in the middle is, is the shovel. Um, and the, the loss of utilization around the shovel is, is there due to waiting trucks. So actually, they're not, they've either got too many trucks or, uh, or they haven't got enough trucks because the, sh the trucks aren't there to be able to pick up the, what the shovels are moving. So, you know, George can now take instant access, management can take instant access to say, how do we address this? Do we put more trucks in the field? What's the utilization of trucks? What's the issues with trucks that we're seeing? Is it the roads? Are they being maintained? You can easily see how you can make corrective actions real time to be able to influence the day's mining, right? Whereas other, in other ways, you know, you would have had to wait, you know, days for the paperwork to come through to be able to make that response, or you'd be doing it through word of mouth, you know, on site or over sort of radio comms. So that's the that's the last part of the the demonstration that I wanted to to cover. Um, I hope I hope that's been um, a, a good runaround for you to understand. The types of capability that can be built, um, what that what that looks like as a journey and, and an experience for 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 this organisation, and I do think that there are a lot of parallels with this, you know, into defence, which is which is why we've checked it. I mean, today they've got more than seven hundred um, users. That, are, that have, you know, near real-time access to this dashboard and operating it, you know, in a portfolio of sites. Um, as I said before, there's been an increase in, in the asset or the equipment life that they've been, they've been using. But these are the, the sort of four core lessons, I think, you know, from Connected Mine, you know, that have, you know, direct relevancy into other complex engineering um, digital transformations. First one, and, and I've, I, I will repeat the same things that I've said before, just to reinforce them, is first one, transform form the core. Put the users at the heart, put the value chain at the heart, simplify, integrate, become data rich, and align the incentives for change. Delivering change is, 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 is core through that user centricity in the value chain because it brings together you know, mutual objectives. Operational excellence, get measurable KPIs. If you can't measure it, you can't manage it. It's very simple. But I still think today we, we, we pick the wrong metrics and therefore don't drive the value chain. But if you start with a value chain and pick the right KPIs, you can then deliver the right value. Learn from adjacent sectors, I think, yeah, absolutely. And, and that's part of, I guess, today's session and how we can, how we can learn more from other areas. Um, value data, there's lots of discussions going on around data. Have a data strategy, get the information architecture right, link that back to the user centricity and the value chain. Um, and then build, look, to, look to get the quality of the data to a standard where it can be trusted. And don't do that for a housekeeping exercise of tidying up, but build that in inherently to your operations so you get trusted data. 
And the last piece is around the, the human side of this. So having a human centered design that sort of links to the user journeys, but also drives the sort of cultural and behavioral change inherent in the operations you've designed, the user centricity and the value chain. And the look at sensors and the datas um, that can look at the sensors and devices that can be used to support that and provide real time operations. And lastly, I would say, and this is a challenge for defense, um, mobility is, is, a, is a core aspect of this. And I think this is an aspect where defense is different when you overlay the security requirements um, needed for operations. And this is where I think a lot of focus is going on today is how do we provide you know, secure uh, mobility and, and visualization of, of, of products such as these. I'll stop the presentation there and I'll hand back to Simon um, just to close out tonight's presentation. No, th thank you, Ross. And um, um, no, as, as, as Ross says, we will soon be moving to, to Q&A, but um, I was just hoping really to, I guess, roll this back up to just three actually very key and I think quite simple considerations that might help us frame what this means for defence as we perhaps explore some of the questions that I can see emerging in the chat box as we, as we go into, go into Q&A. So, so firstly, it's now. Um, and I think actually the, um, I think the uh, response to the mentee at the, at the top of the lecture uh, proved that little convincing is, is required of that, which is, which is great news actually. Um, but as we've just explored in, in, in just, just one example here this evening, the capability absolutely is real. Um, significant benefits are being realized today. Uh, benefits often associated with asset utilization, which are especially attractive to asset intensive industries um, such as defense. And, and I think these sorts of benefits quickly help to build interest and momentum in change journeys. And you know, as we saw in the example of Connected Mine, 6% uh, asset utilization improvement, in fact, has now been recognized, which creates really significant operational output improvements. So the second, second key consideration, common language. So if technology programs traditionally relied on deep requirements analysis or IQ, then realizing value from digital becomes much more about EQ and TQ. EQ to stand in the shoes of the end user and develop truly user-centric and empathetic solutions. And TQ or technology quotient, data fluency, the ability to see opportunities in data and the value that can be realized with digital. And finally, common purpose. Aligning around a North Star is critical to the success of any digital program. The common purpose allows for organizational boundaries and cultural variations to be at least in part overcome if genuine trust exists between stakeholders. This trust must be coupled with space to experiment safely, recognizing the value of fail fast, learn and excel. So with that, um, as, a, as a few key considerations to have rolled back some of what we've heard in the connected mind demonstration this evening. Um, Angus, I will hand back to you to take us into Q&A. Just waiting to come onto screen or I'll just crack on Simon and you can be the center of attention. That's absolutely fine. So thank you very much. Great presentation. Um, a lot of food for thought there and the chat box being going uh, going away like crazy uh, since she started. Um, I, I, I'm going to use the chairman's prerogative, which is I'm going to ask the first question, but it, th there's a number of the questions in the chat box that actually are, you know, link to what I'm about to ask you. Um, because we inevitably we focus on the technology and I'm sure we'll get to some questions in a minute directly on the application of technology and how we and, and how the experience went with that and where that application is. But actually there's a common thing coming out of the chat box and one that's always sort of close to my heart is you can drive this sort of change and you can bring technology and you can even set the conditions to get the technology out there and use it. 
but behaviors and cultures of the people when you bring them into the change environment seems to be one of the major aspects of not being successful in taking this type type of change forward. Could you just say a few words about what the lived experience was, uh, you know, possibly with this with this um, example that you've used tonight, but more broadly in your experience as you've been dealing with this across your supply chain clients? Do you, do you want me to take this one, Simon? And I'll, I'll, you can you can chip in. I think um, I think the experience. I think I think the experience is. I, I completely agree, Angus. That that is the biggest barrier, or one of the biggest barriers to get over. Um, but I think the application here around how do you how do you get to sort of mutual incentives, you know, for all the different stakeholders involved, it is is as much of an art as it is a science. Um, but the, the the key in this one and, and the other digital transformations we're running is is start with the user centricity. You know, the, the users are the ones at the end uh, who are close to the value chain, who see the problems, who see the challenges. Um, so starting there, capturing their perspective on the world is, isn't always necessarily right, but capturing that, mapping it, or some aspects on it aren't always right, but capturing that, mapping it, understanding their, their views and challenges and the solutions to it, then overlaying that with the value chain and the, the priorities that the, the, the sponsors and the, the leaderships and the budget holders wants to be gives you that sort of mutual incentives and bringing those two, two things together because then you put the user centricity at the heart of the value chain you know, that, that, that you're trying to deliver. I think the other, the other aspect of it is, is start small and get confidence, right? So if you can imagine... Um, a user go, going into a workshop, you know, pouring their heart out around, these are the challenges I face. If only you could link this to this. That's really easy to do. You could do that in a week, couldn't you? And then you go away and you come back in two years' time and I've, I've done this with no comms in between or no engagement. You know, it can be, it can be pretty soul-destroying and worse than doing anything in the first place. So I think once you've got that, it's not a one-off activity is what I say. The user centricity, then you go back to it and you show the progress that's making and you show the plan. And from a, a sponsor and more of a leadership perspective, you show how that plan builds into a capability you know, that meets the overall all requirement. And getting that balancing act, it, it, again, is, is a real art. Um, and knowing that some things, you know, will work, some things might not work as well. But if you've got, you know, between four week and 12 week cycles between getting a new version out, it actually doesn't that matter if it's not quite right the first time, because then you can get the feedback from the users and fix it, fix it the next time. And actually, you know, in some areas of defense, it's some of the smaller pieces of work that show a lot of progress that can actually build, build the wider, wider momentum. And, and 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 Ross, maybe maybe just um, some 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 small builds on 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 that, if I may. I, th I think I think we we often talk we often talk about purpose-led supply chain or or the power of purpose. And I think I think this goes to having absolute transparency around what the what the objective is and what that um, I sort of used for North Star term in the summing up, which is perhaps a slightly overused term, but but really taking the time to build a level of actual emotional buy-in around around the ultimate objective that that purpose and that, that comes ultimately with the transparency of the value chain everybody understanding their role in enabling an output an operational output which everybody can see the benefit in so so i, I do think i do think the power of purpose is is enormous i think we um we we sometimes reference um, you know a, a, a recent case study for this having been um, our work on the on the ventilator challenge in fact which in the UK you know we established through the first lockdown you know the first ventilator output 43 days after being you know requested to re-engineer a number of different significant manu manufacturing um, foot, foot, footprints across the aerospace sector which was a huge coming together of you know a number of different stakeholders supporting 
developing you know a product for which you know they they had previously very little experience of of developing but you know the power of purpose you know and that being such a such an obvious purpose you know saving lives um shows shows actually how you can start to effectively um isolate some of those perhaps more sort of technical or um organizational boundaries in a you know in a way that really does sort of stimulate stimulate the opportunity to do things faster and more effectively as a as an ecosystem of, of stakeholders because as i mentioned also in the in the broader sort of disruptive point around supply chain all of this happens as part of an ecosystem um that you know there are very few supply chains which have single points of ownership you know end to end and so you know establishing the ecosystem establishing a common purpose uh, being transparent around the value chain i think can really help to overcome some of those cultural hurdles which you know which so oftentimes um you know create challenges in realizing value from these types of initiatives Excellent. Thanks very much. Um, I think uh, I, I'm going to stick on the, the level, if you like, of the broader institutional aspects, if you like, from a defence perspective on a couple of the questions um, uh, and just get your view on. So uh, you said in key considerations, it's now. Um, and I guess the question, the theme that's coming out is, Okay, but how do you get at it in the defence context? So in the commercial context, you've got bottom line that drives behaviours. In the defence context, um, and I'm just going to go and read Nick's question out because he was first to pull the trigger on a question, and so I think he deserves to have it asked, but it, it relates directly into this, is, you know, the mining demo is great, of course, but, in this, but it's focused on technology, uh, we know we can implement technology rapidly through, you know, innovation initiatives. But when it comes to scaling up, we're hogtied by interdepartmental politics and red tape. What do the presenters suggest we do about the bureaucracy? So I guess we're drawing on your knowledge of the commercial sector, but also dealing with aerospace and defence into defence because of course it has certain institutional ways of doing business processes that don't necessarily relate to the way um, you know, commercial examples would do it. So just be interested to get your view on how you might try and break that kind of, those kind of barriers down. Yeah, I think, I think there's probably two angles on, on that for me. And, and one, I, 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 firstly, I'd agree that that's a huge challenge as well. Um, but some of the ways in which that could be adopted, I think you need to split them and look at them differently. I think there's there's new programs actually where there's the opportunity to think differently and set them up from the start. So things like um, things like Tempest, things like Global Combat Ship. Um, how do we set those new programs up to meet the future demands and not design, you know, their operations? and their um, support models around how we, how we do things today. So that's the first thing. I think we need to look at you know, new programs differently. I think when it comes to dealing with um, legacy programs or sort of existing programs that, that, that we, we have today, I think, I think it's finding an environment where there's, there's like-minded people or leaders within those areas that can come together, that agree that's the right thing to do. Now, that boundary might be very small to begin with, to find that, that area to prove the point and then scale it out. But I, I do think that there are areas within defense where we should look for, where there is a, you know, alignment between the different stakeholder groups, between the frontline commands, between DNS, between industry, between you know, those organizations, um, to see where you know, progress you know, can be made. Um, but again, I. I I think that needs to be done in a very structured way with, with, a, with an end game in mind around how do these collective capability developments and proof points co come together eventually to be able to deliver the, the changes, changes that are needed. But I, I, I think the art will be starting small and, and building momentum. And, and maybe, maybe just also, also briefly just to add to that, I, th I think, uh, and, and of course, you know, I think, I think, the question creates yeah you know, poses a very real challenge what i would say is it's it's not um 
it's not just about the technology and the business. It's about how the approach of digital transformation and the combination of these new types of technologies affects a different way of changing outcomes. And, and we often talk about digital decoupling, uh, which is the concept to say that you're, you're, you're always looking for opportunities to decouple the way that you, you affect operational output with the introduction of some of these emergent technologies and capabilities, su such that you're not constrained by the, by the traditional systems integration um, bureaucracy, if you like, that requires you know five or six stakeholders to agree or you know agree around a, a steer code that a particular you know a particular change should should happen you know over a six month um, investment program. You know this concept of digital decoupling is very much about abstracting abstracting these emergent technologies in a way that prevents you from having to have it, you know, have it, have everybody make those, you know, those significant investments. So I think it's, it's about the approach being different in the way that we create the outcomes. It's, um, it's, it's not, it's not about saying what's the technology consideration and, and what's the business consideration. Excellent. Thanks, Simon. Um, I think the, the second part, if you like, to the, to the, to the higher end institutional um, difficulties is around security. And there's kind of a, theme in a couple of questions. Now, in your example, you talked about getting to an MVP in 12 weeks and developing a digital twin. And we could come back to digital twin because I think that's an important separate subject. Um, uh, I'll just read out an observation by um, uh, uh, James Bolter who said, man had, man had to switch off all the telematic feeds during Op Herrick after they found the data for all SV vehicles was viewable by certain man customers. Um, and if you, if you look at the individual kind of access to data generated by on equipment center, sensors, and then the potential for exploitation in a digital twin and you know, ma maintaining security on that, we know there are sort of significant barriers to this. I guess the question, if I paraphrased it, is, is how, it, in, the, in the mining example you used, speed of outcome was a, you know, a key aspect of the success. But of course, you didn't have these same kind of security issues. How, how did you see defense addressing that based on um, you know, your knowledge of the commercial uh, models you've used, but also how you play that now um, for security of defense data? in this kind of approach yeah that's that's a really good question because that's the the translation to defense that um yeah i picked up on in the case study um and you know to be honest there is a lot of investment going on you know right now to be able to address that exact problem around how do we you know what, what does cl cloud we hear is everywhere. It's in commercial, it's used for, for everything. But what does that mean for defense? You know, we know um, that there are you know, cloud versions now that defense has approved up to, you know, official sensitive that allows it to operate. We know um, the, the sectors, you know, looking and some areas are moving to, you know, collaboration and sharing official sensitive data over, you know, new applications. Um, like Microsoft Teams, um, but it is it is the only the start of the journey around how do we adopt digital, you know, in defence and, and address the secure environment. But I'm confident as well from what I've seen. There's some great sort of startup um, technologies out there, um, which um, are, are doing things in a very different way. But I also think we can learn from from other institutions. So the finance sector, you may say, is that's got nothing to do with defence. But if you can think about the trillions of pounds that they send digitally around the world and the assurance levels that they need to provide around that data, those levels of assurance, I, I think, are absolutely comparable to defence. And those systems are operating you know, on the cloud and they've had you know, organisations um, work with the Barclays and the HSBCs of this world to be able to, to move that adoption and, you know, go through the process with those, with the regulator so that they, they can be assured. So I, I think, I think we need to think a bit more 
creatively around this, around well, the, some of the traditional sectors that we've looked at around heavy industrial might not be the ones that we look to solve some of the digital challenges around security, you know, going forward. But I do, I mean, w- what I'm pleased to see is this is on everybody's um, lips at the moment, this, this question. And, and I don't think there is a, a, a compelling answer to how we do that just yet. I think there's this concepts and development activities, but to be able to do this at scale, and this is doing it at scale in a consistent way, I still think there's, there's, there's a way to go to be able to do that. Excellent, thanks, Ross. Simon, any view on that? Uh, I, I need just briefly to comment that I think perhaps where we see some of the, some of the most significant progress around cloud adoption for, um, you know, for defense more widely in, in, the, in the broader sense of supply chain collaboration actually is in, is in the space of e-commerce. And actually we see certainly, um, you know, in, indeed the Ministry of Defense sort of adopting a number of sort of e-commerce tools which allow them to, to trade um, you know, up, up through tiers of their supply chain um, you know, with certainly commercially sensitive data. Um, and these, these tools you know, have actually for, for a couple of years now been um, supported by cloud hosted environments. So I think, you know, I think there are pockets of cloud adoption happening today in, in the defense sector. And that's, you know, that's just one. Um, so um, it's about, I think, sort of recognizing these, these pockets of good practice and how, you know, how that can be extended into other use cases, which actually affect very similar sorts of um, you know, messages and interactions between people and data, which is ultimately all this is about at the end of the day, um, uh, you know, and, and just how, how that can be extended into other use cases, I think is, um, is the opportunity. Yeah, I, I, yeah, couldn't agree more. And in fact, I would also observe in my own lived experience, you know, even a couple of years ago, how you manage and secure your data in the cloud, for instance, has fundamentally changed as technology has, has enabled us to sort of do that in a fundamentally different way and so you know some of those barriers I guess as the digital backbone gets driven through and we migrate defense more to the cloud um, the ability of kind of if you like the logistic enterprise to hang off that and the conditions set by it will be critical to go forward. Um, I'm I'm just going to move now more down into the kind of you know the, the the technical kind of aspects but it's 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 that old chestnut problem of where you start with data. So um, uh, Verity uh, has asked a question, I'll read it out, but then it just uh, paraphrase a couple of other um, elements from other questions. Uh, Verity asks, with your experience, how would you suggest the Army Defense overcomes its legacy data landscape to enable valuable analytics to be conducted and true digitalization AI efforts to be realized. The data substrategy is cohering this, but progress is slow due to the complexity. Data drives much of our digitalization efforts, especially AI. So do we stampede ahead and let data catch up, acknowledging it won't be perfect? Should I, should I have, yeah, yeah go, I, go let, let me have a go at that. I mean, yeah, I mean, absolutely acknowledge that it won't be perfect. I think, um, you know, I think that's kind of the point of AI actually, is that we're getting into a place where we're no longer talking about binary, bus- binary business rules, but we're talking about patterns and insights that form out of, out of partial data sets, often, you know, often with inaccuracies, um, you know, inherent based on the data supply chain that, that supports that. So, you know, ab- absolutely the recognition of imperfect data is indeed, if you like, the sort of tipping point for the adoption of some of these um, sort of big data strategies backed up by more advanced sort of analytics, AI machine learning type type capabilities. Um, you know, I think I think the kind of question of, um, yeah, the, the sort of question of, of the legacy sort of data environment and, and, and sort of the challenge that that kind of creates, I think that goes back a little bit to my earlier points around digital decoupling, you know, which is to say, um, you know, how is it that we can, you know, best best effect more abstracted technical architectures? So these are these are technical architectures which which 
accept accept you know a lot of operational process will continue to exist within systems of record um you know be those sort of systems which have been perhaps operational for sort of 15 20 years in some cases you know, where, where you know where we're talking about some of the you know some of the legacy sort of defense green screen applications but how but how we can use digital decoupling to to within these abstracted architectures to exactly the point, start to think about the opportunity that exists for things like artificial intelligence, um, you know, to help us to expose new insights from this data. Um, you know, it's only when you it's only when you start to see the power of the insight that you then you, you then can kind of create the business case if you like to go back to source and and recognize why it is that you might want to solve incrementally more of those sort of source system data deficiencies but but until you start in, in, until, until you start to expose some of those early insights it's really it's really hard for people to understand why it is that they would want to you know invest in that in that sort of wider um that wider data strategy which which ultimately is important but 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 won't get you started in the first place um so that so that yeah th those would be sort of I, su I suppose some reflections on 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 that absolutely accept the deficiencies in the data but start but start to create some insights start to create some uh, an excitement in fact actually in terms of what that can start to look like um you know and 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 and, and then and then you know, progress with uh, the core transformation behind mm -hmm. the, the only thing i'd add to that is um look at what simplification activities that you can do within the operations and the process you know, to begin with and, and thin those out. You know, everybody will have swarms and swarms of data. Actually, a lot of it, you know, they won't need if they if they can roll back and think about, you know, what is it I'm trying to achieve? What decisions do I make? How does that fit in the process there? What data do I need? That simplification activity, I think, is absolutely critical to, to thin some of that out. And, and it probably goes back to, to resetting on, you know, a, a bunch of, 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 of legacy um, processes and decisions to be able to do that simplification and reducing complexity activity. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, there's another question. I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing again from across a, a number of questions, but I want, I want to come back to your key considerations on common language and TQ. So um, I, I guess if I kind of paraphrase um, and then kind of add my own slant to it. So what, what one of the challenges is to build TQ in your people, and of course, we really want to. You know, it, it's no good the kind of you know the uh, more than middle aged grey haired major general coming in because he read some G Wiz article in some magazine and wants to get some of that technology. It needs to be part of the culture built from the bottom up, so people know what the art of the possible is and are knowledgeable enough to understand its application and 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 go into your point and then make use it to make better decisions i just wonder if you could sort of give us a view on tq giving it's one of your kind of key considerations and how you go about building that yeah shall i i'll make a start on ross ross um and i know we'll also be keen to build on this one I'm, I'm really pleased it's come up in the questions i think you know it's something that um you know ross ross and i are Sort of quite sort of passionate really about as a as a as a as a consideration here and it's something um you know you know that we see i think really being in the early days of of its kind of recognition across you know across different sectors and some of those sectors perhaps being a little bit further ahead on, on the journey um than others i th i mean i think you know i think you know as, as you as you as you as you say angus ultimately this is you know, this is about how do you start to rotate the the workforce around around some of what for um, yeah if if we sometimes refer to the digital native the 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 idea of the the you know the consumer who who might sort of recognise within their home life the everyday applicability of some of these technologies as relates to you know the way that they the way that they shop for the they use social media and the way that they you know, inter interact with the world and and then and then how how does how does that digital nativity that you know especially is coming up through um you know through the younger generations you know how does that sort of translate into the application of um you know, ent enterprise 
interventions you know within within the workplace um you know we we see you know i, I think we see, sort of see two ways that this is happening one is you know one is that it's happening organically because of what i've just described in terms of those employees are consumers too as I, as i mentioned earlier but also actually we see some some very structured interventions in terms of training investments in 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 key organizations and and these aren't just um you know these aren't just sort of light touch courses these are um, the introduction of of mandatory immersive training that supports people in truly recognizing across five or six key um, sort of digital disruptors what what that what that can mean in terms of value creation for the organization and and you know that being some of those disruptors that I that I called out in the um, in the opening part of the presentation, um, so you know this is a, this is almost a, a stick approach, right? Because the enterprise is is seeing that effectively to not understand how these disruptors can create value for the enterprise, you know, will ultimately actually cause those organisations to be unsuccessful because they will miss opportunity and they won't see the way in which these um, disruptors should be affected you know, with, with within their enterprise. So, um, so yeah. I guess I guess it's that kind of transition of insight that comes from the consumer and the younger generations, and then it's um, you know it's these very purposeful uh, training and inter interventions which are which are really helping increase the TQ um, you know within an organisation, yeah, even even to the point where you know you, you can have TQ scores within an organisation, um, you know you know where some quite sort of significant. Um, so performance incentives will be set around around you know achieving TQ scores, which is which is a way of, sort of putting objective measures in, in place to to, to 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 drive for change. Um, but no, it's um yeah it's, it's it's I think it's a new term to 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 many TQ, but it's something that I think um, we'll all be sort of hearing a lot more about as these as these technologies just become more and more um, you know, prevalent and persevere. You know, persevere more and more through our sort of everyday kind of business lives. I don't know, Ross, if anything to add on, on that. Uh, no, not really. I, I, I completely agree. I, I, I like you. Um, something, you know, I'm quite passionate about in my own sort of understanding in this space. You might, my background isn't a technology background. My background's, you know, an industry background of, of sort of, you know, helping build big hairy things in maritime. Uh, when I when I first came to, I mean, one of the reasons I moved to Accenture a couple of years ago is, is I wanted to bridge the gap between technology and digital and, and the business world. Um, Cause I, I saw, you know, an opportunity to go in this space. And I, when I, when I started, I described myself as a Babel fish. I wanted to be a Babel fish to, to, to provide this translation around how do we, how do we exploit all the power of digital and, and, and technology into into business and into into aerospace and defence. Um, so having structured training packages out there available to people today, I think is a massive step forward. I think we're seeing it a lot, as Simon says, taken very seriously in a lot of the big corporates. Um, and I, I think it's only a matter of time before that type of concept becomes becomes mainstream, um, and um, people are taking it up in in, in all sectors. Brilliant. Thank, thank you, Ross. Um, I think the next question, um, and it's probably going to have to be our last one, I'm afraid, um, is really centred around, um, let me bring two sort of elements together here. Um, the cent Part of the central proposition in your um, Connected Minds example was digital twin um, and how you built the digital twin and how you use that to take the concept forward, you know, both to uh, visualize the art of the possible, but also then to kind of, you know, build in the dashboards and, and take forward the KPIs. Um, now, there's a couple of kind of questions in this, hence why I'm going to make it the last one. So, so at, at that level, digital twin and its application, and of course, there's a lot of talk in defense, there's a lot of digital twin work going on. How central is that to scaling up and being able to take the kind of, you know, MVP in 12 weeks to something, to a scale that defense could actually use and make, you know, real, you know, user outcomes come, come to life. Um, and then sort of second part of the question uh, re re really centers on um, the, the lived experience of the user journey 
that you started at the bottom of, which are kind of, you see what I mean? So you've got the kind of the digital aspect of digital twin and then sitting down and writing the user journey to visualize outcomes that I guess are linked to, now this is where I do think defense um, uh, really, um, you know, runs around to try and pin this one down. I think we all do um, is KPIs. So we kind of got the user journey through the digital kind of lens to a KPI that's meaningful, i.e. you can then measure it using the data you pick out. So there's a little bit of convoluted way to try and bring kind of the, you know, the digital journey and the user journey together to scale up and set yourself the right kind of metrics. If that makes some kind of sense when I'm trying to pull about three threads together there, I apologize. Um, but perhaps you could kind of talk us through that a little bit. Yeah, certainly. So I think coming back to your, your the first question around, you know, the, the, the digital twin. Yeah. And again, lots of discussion on this. I think the key for me around this is, is finding the, the use case around it. So, you know, coming back to the, the, why the user journeys and the value chain were so central at the beginning is actually if your digital twin doesn't actually support the, any of those aspects, then actually it's not that, that useful to you. So you need to be able to find a way that actually that, that is either um, helping, helping um, automate, you know, processes, controls, that fit within the value chain delivery and, and, the, and the user journey challenges and any of the sort of key processes and operational elements that obviously sit underneath that value chain. What, what we talk actually also a lot of um, at the moment, Angus, more in, in a lot in the aerospace sector and the, the Airbus program they have around um, DDMS just now is around the, the digital continuity and, and the flow of information through the through the life cycle, so it's not it's not just the, the digital twin itself. It's it's how does that providing digital continuity through the life cycle? So if you are taking an asset from from concept into build um, into in service support and all the way through the sort of life cycle structure, how are you providing sort of digital continuity? through those activities with documentation sets, configuration change, usage, support, all of those types of things. So not, not complicating your model any further. I, I do think that there's a, there's a vertical buildup, you know, like you, like you described around user centricity, the value chain, the processes, but also there's a horizontal one around, you know, digital continuity so that you get the flow. And, and, and this is, I think, one of the real challenges in, in the, defense structure that we have with some of the stovepipes that, that sit in either for organization reasons or commercial reasons is that transfer of, of data gets lost and effectively needs to be rebuilt or it only partially gets transferred. I think that the, the, the challenge for me is how do we get better, you know, digital continuity, you know, through, um, through our life cycles on, on, on our assets and products. Well, and one one um, one other aspect I might I might add in terms of in terms of uh, the opportunity around around digital twin. Uh, I, I think I think we talked uh, we talked in the context of connected mind a lot around around the live environment and getting as close to sort of near real time representation of a asset and its um, and its um, conditions. You know to make as you know as as proactive decisions as, as, as is possible. I think one other very interesting use case for Digital Twin actually, which we see, I guess, per persevering, especially within the industry side of defense and other, other sort of heavy asset intensive program orientated industries is for use of Digital Twin to create concurrent planning capabilities. So this is effectively to take offline your Digital Twin and say, what if? So if if I know what my if I know what my value chain looks like and I can see what my value chain is doing today, what if I freeze it in a point in time and say, what if what if my tier two supplier falls over because of um, the next pandemic? Um, what if um, the operational output um, yeah has to has to double and I need to affect changes in my yeah in in, in my supply side? So I think I think 
often often we forget actually we, we're always sort of chasing as getting as close to real time as possible but actually taking digital twins offline and using it to create concurrent models and simulate those different types of outcomes i think is hugely powerful for the defense sector and as, as i say those those companies those organizations which are pivoted towards program based decisions um, value a lot from this type of concurrent planning capabilities so um just just another another consideration in terms of in terms of digital twin excellent thanks very much uh, you know a really complex subject as we know i think anything to uh, you know help us explore the whole digital subject has been absolutely brilliant i'm afraid we have reached the witching hour um at the end of our q a session so i just would really like to say you know huge thanks to accenture um uh, and obviously very particularly to ross and simon for um a supporting the foundation B, taking the time to put such an excellent presentation together with, uh, I think, a case study that's really driven some, you know, tremendous thinking into the, you know, you, you said the adjacent sectors and how they apply to um, to defence. Uh, I come back to, and in fact, you mentioned the, the other sector, Ross, that I have always been interested in, you know, banking, uh, upstream oil and gas and mining by the very nature of the aspects we discussed, I think are tremendous adjacent sectors for defence to be looking at. And of course, they are driving ahead in many ways, um, you know, with the application of, uh, you know, technology in the value chain. But, um, you know, this particular case study, you know, digital use to really create value in a specific challenging context. I think is exactly the kind of case study that you know is really useful for us to take that forward. I I have written down and will think hard now about your key considerations because I think I think it you know no question it's now. I think it was actually yesterday. But the trouble is is of course you know the speed now that technology is driving uh, change is is part of the real challenge for particularly institutions like defence where process can't necessarily keep up with the speed of technological change, which is not that defence isn't addressing that, they are in huge ways, but it still remains a tremendous challenge. Um, I'm fascinated by the common language, IQ, EQ and TQ coming together. Um, I, you know, I, I don't think uh, you know, in, in any organisation we're probably short of IQ and EQ, but TQ I think is something we need to think really hard about. How do we build that? Um, uh, and, and how do we get people into that space to really, you know, press their brain cells to think hard about, you know, what what level is their TQ at, and, and how do they how do they take that forward? And then I think, you know, speaking to a kind of a, you know, a military environment in you know in the Raw Logistic Core Foundation, that aspect of your audience, common purpose is something we train from the day we join the army. Um, but how you apply that in these highly technical environments where, you know, complexity just compounds on complexity, compounds on complexity is a really, really interesting conundrum to, uh, to get at. Um, but I kind of come back to also another good military principle, Ross, you mentioned it, keep it simple and try and press ahead with the things that you can deliver uh, and work on the harder stuff in the margins. So, Thank you very much. Uh, really appreciated it. We had a great audience, some great questions, um, and uh, you know, really look forward to um, you know, kind of taking forward some of those conclusions um, and uh, and discussing them further in in different environments. Could I also please say thank uh, uh, say thank you to um, the RLC Foundation team, Alan and Chrissy, for doing all of the you know inevitably hard work in the background to pull all of this together. Um, uh, it's been a fantastic event under these kind of circumstances, online lockdown, and yet we can still do a brilliant, you know, interactive uh, lecture uh, like this, um, uh, which is also enabled by Cloud Hill Productions, who've done us a great job tonight by uh, uh, facilitating the technical aspects of it. So thanks, Ross and Simon, um, and uh, we hope to continue the conversation with you going forward in the future. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.